Coming up in today's newscast, the U.S. officially moves its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Thousands of Palestinians march in protest of the U.S. embassy move. And Israel's Eurovision winner Neta Belzilai finally lands back home in Tel Aviv. It's been 21 years since the United States Congress passed the Jerusalem Embassy Act. And finally, the U.S. Embassy has been moved from Tel Aviv. The momentous occasion was set to coincide, of course, with Israel's 70th birthday, and hundreds have come from all over the world to attend the unveiling. Distinguished guests and dear friends, Tammy and I welcome you to the opening and dedication of the United States Embassy in Jerusalem, Israel. Ambassador Friedman led the event, which was attended by hundreds of officials from around the world. Even though President Trump wasn't able to physically attend, he addressed the crowds via video message, where he repeated how important it was for him to follow through on his campaign promise to move the embassy, especially with respect to history. But he also made sure to reiterate his commitments to open-ended negotiations. As I said in December, our greatest hope is for peace. The United States remains fully committed to facilitating a lasting peace agreement, and we continue to support the status quo at Jerusalem's holy sites, including at the Temple Mount, also known as Haram al-Sharif. Following President Donald Trump's brief message, his daughter and senior advisor Ivanka Trump finally unveiled the official seal of the new U.S. Embassy. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu then took to the stage to speak himself. Dear friends, what a glorious day. Remember this moment. This is history. President Trump by recognizing history, you have made history. Over a century ago, the Balfour Declaration recognized the right of the Jewish people to a national home in this land. And exactly 70 years ago today, President Truman became the first world leader to recognize the newborn Jewish state. Last December, President Trump became the first world leader to recognize Jerusalem as our capital. And today, the United States of America is opening its embassy right here in Jerusalem. Thank you. Thank you, President Trump, for having the courage to keep your promises. While the embassy opening has been widely celebrated by Israelis, around 50,000 Palestinians have been protesting the move in riots along the border between Israel and the Gaza Strip. Thousands more have been marching in the West Bank. Dozens have been killed and hundreds wounded in Gaza during clashes with the Israeli army, but still, the tone of the event has been one of great thanks for the bargaining relations between the United States and Israel. The opening of the embassy falls on the 70th anniversary of Israel's independence, making the moment even more special for attendees. It's so important, especially for my next generation, to understand that this is such a significant moment in time, and I'm so honored to be a part of this. Well, today is the big day. The American envoy, led by U.S. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, along with Ivanka Trump and Jared Kushner, has just inaugurated the official new site of the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. The ceremony has gone off without a hitch, and needless to say, it's an exciting day for Israelis. In Jerusalem, the day is calm, and though some tensions exist in the streets, the whisper of history is in the air. ILTV's Brett Allen Smith is in Jerusalem now with more. So right now we're outside the Jaffa Gate to the old city of Jerusalem. Now, typically, this is a real flashpoint for tension between Israelis and Palestinians, um, but today's the day the embassy is opening, and as you can see, the gates are open, tourists are coming in and out, and it feels like a normal day. In fact, it feels like more than a normal day. It feels like a peaceful, great day. Now, security is boosted. We've seen a lot more uh, police and soldiers inside the old city and in, in the new city. Um, but we also see American flags, a lot of red, white, and blue signs that say, welcome, Mr. President, welcome, Trump. America, make Israel great. So the mood here is pretty great.
For millions of Israelis, especially those living in the holy city of Jerusalem, this is a day thousands of years in the making. Despite semantics, Israelis have long seen Jerusalem as their capital city, a feeling many Americans have also shared. But for locals and visitors alike, clearly Trump's symbolic move of the embassy is an indicator that the winds of change are in the air. To be here for their 70-year anniversary, to be here for the opening of the embassy, when countless of our presidents should have signed it, that document years ago, but chose not to, but Trump did. And we say, go Trump. For others, today's reality is something far more than mere politics. It's a destiny fulfilled. It's prayer. It's the church has been praying for many, many years. And the new president that we have, we were, we prayed for him. You know, we voted for him because he loves Israel. He loves America. He loves the people. He loves the church. And that's what we needed. The optimism in the air is palpable, but with that comes caution. Security has ramped up throughout Jerusalem in an effort to keep things calm. Normally, these alleyways are jam-packed with tourists. Today, the numbers are a bit fewer than usual, a reflection of today's political implications. Anything in the air, good, bad, otherwise? Um, a bit of everything, you know, good, um, good, bad. You can feel it's, it's one way almost. <laughs> It's uh, with the respect and the love to my country. Sometimes it's come too aggressive. One thing we heard a lot of people say this morning, this was uh, U.S. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, Florida's Governor Rick Scott, many Israeli politicians as well say is that uh, this decision to move the embassy really is also in the interest of the American people, in the interest of preserving American national security. And that's generally the sense that we get when we talk to a lot of people here. Uh, for Palestinians and for Arab shop owners that we talk to who are reluctant to be on camera, I will say that for them, this is a sad day. This is a day that for them throws a lot of their dreams into a lot of uh, uncertainty. They don't know what tomorrow brings, but for all the Israelis we talk to, for many tourists we talk to, the feeling in Jerusalem today is uh, very safe, very calm. It's not what they expected. They expected a lot of tension, a lot of clashes. Yesterday we saw tons of clashes uh, on the Temple Mount right behind us here, but a lot of that is gone now. And uh, as you can see, it's a peaceful, calm day. Life goes on, shops are open, tourists are here. It's really beautiful day in Jerusalem. The Israeli military is taking on a wave of massive protests along the Gaza security fence today. The so-called March of Return protests have been set to coincide with the moving of the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, which has just taken place. The Gaza Health Ministry claims that around 1,000 Palestinians have been injured and around 37 killed in clashes as Israel defends itself. The army says at least three of those Palestinians killed were shot down as they attempted to lay a bomb on the border. Right now, 50,000 people are currently taking part in the protest, but more than 100,000 Palestinians are expected to join in. The IDF is warning that hundreds plan to breach the Gaza border fence and massacre Israeli civilians. At least five wildfires have already broken out on the Israeli side of the Gaza border after several incendiary kites were flown into Israel from the coastal enclave. Israeli firefighters and emergency personnel are on the scene. The IDF says an Israeli aircraft targeted a Hamas post in Jabalia after shots were fired at Israeli troops stationed in the area. The Shin Bet has just released a statement claiming that Iran is funding Hamas's efforts to promote violence and attacks against Israel under the cover of these mass demonstrations. Gaza protesters are setting tires on fire to send thick plumes of smoke into the air at several spots along the border, and others are hurling rocks at soldiers. There are no reports of Israelis injured or immediate calculations for how much Israeli farmland has actually been burned, but Israeli news claims that the Palestinian Authority is encouraging the protests, and Hamas is telling Gazans that they will be guaranteed a place in paradise if they die in the violence. Early this morning, Israeli military aircraft dropped leaflets over the Gaza Strip to warn Palestinians from approaching the fence separating the coastal enclave from the IDF, saying, Hamas is trying to hide many of its failures by endangering your lives. Don't be puppets in the hands of Hamas. In the West Bank, several thousand people have gathered in the center of Ramallah, while hundreds are marching to the Kalandia crossing on the outskirts of Jerusalem. Military intelligence officials do not believe that Hamas or the Palestinian Authority are currently interested in war, but expect to see significant violence on the Gaza border in the coming days.
Well, with all of the focus on the embassy in Jerusalem, it's easy to forget that there's still a compound right here in Tel Aviv. So when the celebrations finally die down, what will the move really mean? IOL TV's Aaron Porras joins us now from the Tel Aviv embassy and Hayel Kohn Street with the story. So it is official. The ribbon has been cut. The signs are up. The Twitter handle is officially changed. The embassy has moved to Jerusalem. But what does that mean for the embassy here in Tel Aviv? And more importantly, what does that mean for the either citizens of the United States or the visitors from the United States who are here in Israel now? At least for now, President Trump has nixed the idea of opening a new complex for the embassy in Jerusalem in favor of expanding upon the existing consular building compound. Aside from meaning an expedited ribbon cutting for Israel's 70th birthday, it's also been estimated to be faster and cheaper than starting from scratch. But just because the name has officially been changed, it doesn't mean the Jerusalem compound is fully operational. Most of the initial changes in the move are symbolic and in name only. At first, a small number of offices within the existing facility in Jerusalem will be expanded to accommodate Ambassador Friedman and his staff. They, plus the existing consular officers already there, will make up about a team of 50. Friedman will retain his offices here in Tel Aviv uh, until more and more of the compound is expanded to accommodate everybody, and then the final purpose-built embassy will be made. The plan could take years. Still, while expats remain largely confused about how the shuffling of staff will affect their services in the future, many Israelis are welcoming and celebrating the acknowledgement. I feel very happy. I think uh, President Trump has some guts. And I think that uh, it's a move that is going to completely change the situation in Middle East. This is something we wait for him like dozens of dozens of years to get it. For like to believe that really our capital is Jerusalem. Everyone should know that. And maybe even in the future we can share this city together. Who knows? Israeli motorcycle club Samson's riders even decided personally to symbolically escort flags from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem in honor of the occasion. God bless America and God bless Israel. We're united. It's a pleasure to us to do what we do today. That's it. We love you, America. So in the end, not much has really changed. Services in the foreseeable future will continue as they have. The Jerusalem staff with the new official title as embassy will continue issuing passports and visa services as they've been, gradually increasing their services to be full spectrum in the end. Then the branch in Agron Street in Jerusalem will continue working for the Palestinian areas, and Tel Aviv's embassy will continue for now with full services, just under the title of being a branch. Between President Trump's decision to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem and leave the Iran nuclear deal, many suspect that the American leader and Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu are becoming more and more in sync. But who's influencing who more? And what will they do next? Joining me in the studio now to try and answer is Professor Eitan Gilbo, the Director of the Center for International Communications at bar -Ilan University. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. All right, so does Netanyahu speak fluent Trump or is it the other way around? What would you say? Both. Obviously, they come from the same world view. They agree on the real major threats uh, to the Middle East and the most effective ways to deal with them. Iran is the number one source mm -hmm. of instability, terror, and, and violence. I consider the withdrawal from the Iran nuclear deal and the imposition of sanctions, uh, two moves that the two sides really share similar views about are only the first steps in yeah. the direction of, uh, of curbing Iran's manipulations and political and military interventions in the region. So, so you believe that this partnership and its strength came from Iran specifically, but are there any other factors here? Um, you know, Trump obviously from the beginning was very interested in getting involved in the Middle East conflict. What do you, what do you say were kind of the biggest influences? Well, Trump, unlike Obama, considers Israel as a, a reliable strategic ally in the Middle East and as such uh, uh, supports close collaboration on the main issues uh, of the region. Uh, when uh, Israel is strong, the United States is strong, and vice versa. Well, that's actually where my next question comes in. Who is benefiting more from this partnership? It's Both. Kind of, you Both. Would... I must say that uh, uh, the, the American leadership that came to the opening of the embassy said, 
uh, the transfer of the embassy, U.S. embassy to Jerusalem is an, an American interest and that the United States will not demand any reciprocal concessions in other areas mm -hmm. such as uh, the, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So mutual strategic interests in the region. Well, you can certainly see that there is, you know, um, a strengthening of relationships just in, obviously, uh, the, the actual move in the ceremony that we saw today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. All right. Jerusalem was quite the sight to see yesterday. Thousands of Israeli youth marched through the capital's old city as part of the annual flag dance parade to the Western Wall, a tradition that marks the 51st anniversary of Israel's capture of East Jerusalem. <laughs> And I'm here to celebrate the freedom of Jerusalem for the last 51 years. But actually, Jerusalem was ours for the last 3,000 years. So for 19 years, it was occupied by the Jordanians. Now it's ours. And that's it. So we celebrate it. Israel seized East Jerusalem and the West Bank from Jordan in the 1967 Middle East War. The Jewish state then annexed East Jerusalem, but declared the entire city the undivided capital of Israel. Until today, every year thousands of Israelis participate in the Jerusalem Day March to celebrate the historic occasion. But the Palestinians aren't happy about it. They want East Jerusalem to be the capital of their future state, and believe these festivities threaten that reality. Indeed, Israeli police deployed thousands of security officials across across the city ahead of the march yesterday to make sure that there was no violence. More than 3,000 police officers are located, both border police units, undercover agents, and special patrol units to prevent any incident. And these are part of all the security measures taking place in Jerusalem this week. About 30,000 people took part in this year's Jerusalem Day Parade, a march that comes just one day before the opening of the new U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. Israelis are celebrating the big move of the embassy from Tel Aviv today because it breaks decades of U.S. policy and officially recognizes Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. The Beitar Jerusalem soccer team is already known for its controversial fan club and long history of anti-Arab and anti-Muslim sentiments. Now it looks like the team is going to be making a bit of an identity change by changing its name to Beitar Trump Jerusalem, all in honor of the American president's decision to move the U.S. Embassy to the Israeli capital. The soccer club announced the change on Sunday, just one day before the official embassy move. Beitar Jerusalem, or Beitar Trump, is known as Jerusalem's largest soccer club, but it's also known for its ultra-nationalist fan club, La Familia, which is infamous for its violent and racist behavior. In fact, last year, 19 members of the group were charged with attempted murder against rival supporters. Earlier this year, the club promised to crack down on racist fans and change its unofficial policy of never hiring an Arab Muslim player. But it looks like the first team change will be the club's name. Here's what the team's Facebook had to say about it. Beitar Jerusalem is one of the most prominent symbols of the city and is happy to honor President Trump for his love and support with a gesture of our own. We will be adding the name of the American president who made history to the club's title. And from now on, we'll be called Beitar Trump Jerusalem. Interesting, huh? All right, the queen has arrived. Israel's very own Eurovision winner, Neta Barzilai, has just landed in Tel Aviv, and she's already going to be performing a victory concert in Tel Aviv's Rabin Square this evening. It's no shocker that thousands, including myself, are expected to attend. Neta landed in Ben Gurion Airport early this morning, where she danced to a crowd of waiting fans and journalists. <laughs> ועבורנו כמשלחת, ועבורנו כמדינה שאין לה הרבה סיבות לשמוח כרגע, וזו עושה אותי מאושרת להבין שהבאנו סיבה כזאת לשמוח. Just hours after her win yesterday, thousands flocked to central Tel Aviv to celebrate. 200 million people around the world watched the Eurovision, which started on Saturday night and went well into Sunday morning. Neta's Eurovision win marks the fourth for Israel and also guarantees Israel's right to host the event next year. This will be the first time since 1998, a whole 20 years ago. 
Cyprus and Israel had already been marked as the favorites going into the contest this year, but Israel emerged well ahead following the public vote. And boy, did she make the crowds go crazy. Her crazy chicken moves caused a social media storm, with even Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu trying out the move himself. Wonder Woman Gal Gadot, of course, made sure to congratulate Netta online, posting a video of her acceptance speech in which Netta thanked the audience for choosing different and celebrating diversity. It looks like Netta herself represents a real Wonder Woman. Still so exciting. All right, Israel isn't the only one celebrating a big birthday this month. Just a few months ahead of his 100th birthday, the beloved late composer Leonard Bernstein will be honored at this year's Abu Ghosh Shavuot Festival. Bernstein was the creative genius behind the music of productions like West Side Story. And joining me now is the conductor who will be trying to fill his shoes, Stanley Berber, thanks for coming in. <laughs> You're most welcome. All right, so tell us about the Abu Ghosh Festival, first of all. Uh, the Abu Ghosh Festival uh, takes place twice a year in Sukkot and Shavuot, and we've decided to honor Bernstein, whose shoes I am not trying to fill, uh, in our concert on the, <laughs> on the 18th, Friday, at 11.30 in the morning. Uh, the uh, concert will be mostly Bernstein. There will also be three other composers, Benjamin Britten, uh, Paul Ben Chaim and Yecheskel Brown. You could call it the three B's saluting Bernstein. Yeah. And uh, it's in an incredible place, the Abu Ghosh, with a, with a church with unbelievable acoustics. Absolutely. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and there's a festival every year, obviously. Two. There are two festivals every year. So this is uh, obviously not the first, but um, the focus on Bernstein is very specific. Tell us something that kind of surprises you or excites you about Bernstein's music more specifically? Well, uh, the major works that we're performing is, is to Chichis the Psalms, uh, which is an incredible piece that he wrote uh, uh, for a church in uh, Chichester in England. And we will be performing the version with uh, harp, uh, percussion, and, uh, and piano, and with a wonderful boy soloist who always steals the show. Absolutely. Well, I mean, this is going to be exciting to see for sure. So can you repeat for us again that this festival is going to be on May 18th to 20th, right? Right, three um, days. How much, how much are the tickets for those who are interested in attending? The tickets are 150 shekels and okay. there's, uh, there's a, uh, a reduction that... of 10 percent of people who mention anybody who's performing in the festival. Ah. And it's worth it. Well, now I know somebody. You, yeah. you, now you do. Yeah, You yeah. mentioned my name and they'll charge you 50 percent more. Uh, oh, no. Don't tell in. me that. <laughs> All right, I won't mention your name. Okay, good. I wouldn't do that. Um, so, uh, yeah, so what you, you were saying that there's uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a spectacular place to hear a concert because the acoustics are so, so wonderful. And, and the, the whole atmosphere there is, is yeah. beautiful. Abu Ghosh, as you know, is a, a well-known Arab village about 20 minutes outside of Jerusalem and also has probably the best hummus and trina in the country. So yet another reason to go and attend this Absolutely. festival, right? Thank you so much for joining us. You're most welcome. All right. Israel is already known as a fertility capital for providing free in vitro fertilization to its citizens who are having trouble getting pregnant. But now a new treatment developed at the Ben Gurion University could change everything. Israeli researchers are currently developing a single-dose fertility treatment that could improve both male and female fertility. The groundbreaking tech is based on a telomerase activating compound. What does that mean? Well, telomerase is the enzyme responsible for the maintenance of telomeres, which are the DNA sequences at the tip of a chromosome that affect the lifespan of cells and contribute to infertility. The Israeli treatment re-elongates the telomeres and protects cells from damage, increasing the likelihood of fertilization. It's applied as a single dose and works within 24 hours. And guess what? The treatment also shows a protective effect for people undergoing radiation therapy for cancer. The breakthrough still needs to be tested in human clinical trials before it can be commercialized, but it shouldn't be too long until that happens. The global fertility services market is expected to exceed $21 billion by 2020. The Hebrew Word of the Day is brought to you by IDC Samru Ulpan, open to everyone. And now for our Hebrew word of the day. In honor of the opening of the new U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem, several large delegations from all over the world have come to celebrate. That's why today's word is mishlachat, meaning delegation. A mishlachat can be any group of people with a shared mission. So in diplomacy, the mishlachat might be referred to as a delegation. Mishlachat can also mean expedition or mission, so you could talk about a mishlachat to the North Pole or the top of Mount Everest. Whatever the case, we hope that if you're part of a mishlachat, you're proud of it. 
All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be clear to partly cloudy with a low of 63 or 17 degrees Celsius. Tomorrow you can expect partly cloudy skies and a slight rise in temperatures to a high of about 77 or 25 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.57 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for watching.